Hello, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Artist Loft class on mixed media roses. This is part one of a two part class, and uh, we had to move tonight's class to tonight from last week because I'm in Austin, Texas, and was without power last week during that ice storm. So um, tonight is obviously part, part one, and then part two of the class will be on February 23rd. Um, so next week will actually be a premium class, uh, the first of a, a two-part premium class on uh, figure drawing using a grid. Uh, that'll be on Wednesday night next week, and the, the following week will be part two of that class. And then on the 23rd, uh, we will have the uh, second part of tonight's class and the link to the sign up for part two of Mixed Media Roses should be in the uh, the chat very soon. And uh, if you're watching this later on YouTube, you can find the uh, link to sign up for that class on uh, the Michaels website. And you can just scroll, uh, you know, through the, the listings of the classes by date until you get to the 23rd and you should see the Mixed Media Roses part two class uh, for tonight or for the continuation of tonight. Um, okay, so hopefully there are no questions about that. I know it's a little confusing since we had to break it up a little bit that way, but it was unavoidable. Uh, and I'm Adrian Hodge, your instructor for this evening, and this is an ongoing series that I've partnered with Michaels to bring you using Artist Loft supplies. And I, you can follow me on Instagram. I'm going to switch to my tabletop view. Oh, geez, I appear to be frozen as I'm switching to my tabletop view there. Let me switch back and try that one more time. Okay, there we go. Um, you can follow me on Instagram at Adrian Hodge Art. Don't forget to tag your work with the hashtags Make It With Michaels or Michaels Classes from this evening. And here's a couple of my business cards on showing my ethereal skyscapes using calligraphy ink. You can also follow me on Facebook at Adrian Hodge Fine Arts if you wanna check out more of my work. Okay, so uh, we're gonna be creating something that looks something like this by the end of part two, or maybe something like that, or maybe something like this. I did three different versions of this. That's the one I think that was was used to advertise the class. I was playing around with, um, oftentimes when I'm working, I will do, uh, especially if I'm trying out a new idea. I think I tried this with um, maybe the uh, watercolor markers, and then I thought the watercolor pencils needed to, to get a day in the sun. So, um, so I switched it up, but I get impatient sometimes when I'm waiting for things to dry and I wanted to have a um, couple of different you know, layers going when I was trying this out. And so that's why I have multiple of these, um, which is nice for tonight. And yeah, if you tend to get impatient when you're waiting for things to dry, or if you have a tendency to overwork your layers when you're, you're painting, if you know that about yourself, then working on two pieces of paper or two or three versions at a time is nice because you can kind of do a little bit in one and then try something else on the other one. So yeah, I wanted to, to try out like a few different methods of doing this and that's why I have multiple versions of this. Okay, so we're using the Artist Loft watercolor pencils and I believe I put the 36 piece set on the supply list. Uh, my apologies if that's wrong. But I've got the Artist Loft watercolor pencils. Uh, we've got a sketching and drawing set. We've got some Artist Loft tape. We've got the Artist Loft illustration pens. We've got a white jelly roll pen to add those little sparkles that are kind of a signature thing that I do, like star splatter. 
And then we've got the um, Artist Loft watercolor brushes, a set of 10 of those. And I believe that is it. Uh, if there's any supply that, oh, I didn't mention, let me know. I definitely forgot to mention watercolor paper. So I've got the Artist Loft 7x10 watercolor paper. And then I provided a photograph for tonight. Um, let me just pull that up. I'm going to be using the digital version of the, the photograph because my print printout was not looking amazing. And I thought that is just not, not acceptable. So I'm going to use the, the dig digital version of the photo. And that should have been included to download on the supply list. Any question about supplies before we get started? I don't see any questions so far. Okay, great. Um, so we're gonna start with uh, taping our paper down to our work surface. So I'm gonna tear out a piece of the watercolor paper and you might start on sketching paper if you're um, sketching skills leave a little bit to be desired. Also, if you struggle at all with um, sketching these roses, you can check out uh, the flower fundamentals class that we had uh, over the summer, um, last summer, I believe, or sometime uh, several months ago. I did a class called uh, flower fundamentals drawing roses and I broke down all the different parts of a rose the drawing the center of the rose the overall form the spiral um, and then zoomed in on flower petals and talked about the contours and uh, value shapes that you see on a rose so uh, I'm going to do very minimal sketching of the rose but uh, tonight but if Adrian. you're, oh, yes. Sorry. Um, so we do have a couple of questions now. Uh, the first one is, can you repeat, is the paper hot or cold pressed? Say that one more time. Is the paper hot or cold pressed? Oh, it's a uh, cold pressed. It doesn't say that on the, the block, but if you're working with a different brand of, of paper uh, other than Artist Loft. Oh no, it does say cold press up here. I don't know if Artist Loft makes hot press uh, paper. I should look into that. Um, but yeah, it's cold press. Perfect. And the second question I have is, um, will we be painting today or, or will today be more about outlining a sketch? Um, we well, we're using the watercolor pencils. So we're definitely going to be, yeah, I think we, we should get at least at least one, if not two layers, um, like this was my early stage piece that I never finished. We might have something that looks like this by the end of the class, but we might not get that far. It might just, you know, it depends on, you know, questions and um, sometimes interruptions, you know, but my aim is to get at least one layer of, of water um, on these watercolor pencils and maybe two if we can. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. And thank you for saying that because that just reminded me that I did not fill up my water cup. So if you didn't grab a water cup and fill it up with water and grab a paper towel, now would be a good time to do that. Okay. I got my water cup and my paper towel. So yeah, we're definitely gonna get, and then the optional thing, speaking of painting, was a hairdryer. Um, if you are impatient to get layers to dry, and that was the other reason I wanted to leave one of mine unfinished because I'm working smarter, not harder, y'all. I've done enough of these classes to know that sometimes I get to you know, a point at the end of these classes where I need to speed up the drying time, but I don't want to really pull out my hair dryer, so I might just kind of jump to this while I'm waiting for, for paper to dry and continue adding on to that for the sake of time. Okay, so uh, yeah, but if you're struggling with the drawing and sketching aspect of this right now with me, 
then you can just, you know, put a pin in it and check out that drawing fundamentals class on uh, drawing roses and then come back to this and it should be a little easier to capture the the essence of this this rose image because that's mainly what we're going to put in our our sketch here. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and tape my paper down. When I'm taping paper down, it's nice to get it half on and half off the um, the edge of the paper. And I put down my little, I was doing some collaging the other day, so I pulled out my, my cutting mat and I was like, oh, this would be a nice backdrop for the class. So I decided to leave it there. And they do have these at Michael's. I'm not sure if, I think they do have these in the Artist Loft brand, these, um, these mat boards like this with the cutting boards. They definitely sell them at Michael's. Hopefully I'm not um, misquoting that they're Artist Loft brand. I do not recall. Anyway, all right, so I'm taping it half on and half off the edge of the paper so that I can get a mostly straight line and it's helpful that I've got a ruler um, behind me on this, this surface but don't worry about measuring and making it perfect. I hardly ever measure when I'm doing that. And if it's a little lopsided at the end, I think it's usually not very noticeable. So um, that's my motto when it comes to taping things down. But if you wanna grab a ruler and measure a little a quarter inch or half inch uh, margin on each side so that you're taping it down evenly, go right ahead. And the reason for taping it down, even though we are not going to, well, it is gonna get pretty wet and, and the paper might buckle. So that's one reason. But the main reason I like to tape things down is because when we take that tape off at the end, we just get this nice clean edge all around and it just elevates the drawing. So I highly recommend taping it, even if you're not concerned about paper buckling or any of those things, because it puts a nice little frame around your work and just elevates it. And I think it looks really nice. It makes something, it kind of makes almost anything look frame worthy when you do that. So why not use every every trick that's out there to make our art more satisfying for us. All right, so I'm just taping that down cl cleanly on all four sides, and that's another nice reason for having this um, cutting board here, because I can just move this aside and it won't be taped to my desk for a, more than a week, because we won't be coming back to this until the 23rd the day before my birthday in case any of y'all wanted to tell me almost happy birthday on the 23rd. Okay, so we got it taped down and then I'm gonna grab a, a B pencil, but I recommend you use an H pencil so that your lines are nice and light and easy to erase. Um, people are always wanting to use the exact same pencil that I'm using, but I'm only using a B pencil so that my lines will be visible to you on the Zoom. Um, if I were drawing by myself and not on the Zoom class right now, I would not have, I would not use a B pencil. I would use an, like a 2H or a 4H so that my lines were nice and light and so that I could easily erase them when I'm done. Although I can still see some of my pencil lines on this and it's not the end of the world, but they're light. So that's why it doesn't bother me. Oh, I saw somebody said happy birthday already. Thank you. Soaking up my last few weeks of being 40. But yeah, see, we can erase those pencil lines at the end if we draw nice and lightly. And then we have just the the watercolor creating a nice composition there. Okay, so we're just gonna do a very loose sketch here and I'm not gonna go into how to draw roses because I've already done that class on roses, but this 
photograph. Oh my goodness, you can see my my ring light reflection on the like you can see the the man behind the curtain right now. Oh well. Um all right, so when you're taking a photograph, it's nice to remember the rule of thirds, right? We've talked about composition in a number of classes. And one thing that I did in when taking this photograph of these roses many years ago is I lined up the area of interest in the composition with where the lines of thirds would intersect. So that would be right here. This is my focal point. So if as you're sketching, you crop some things out because I know that naturally happens um, when, you know, different people are drawing the same photo. We might, you know, shift or move some things over. You want to try to get this area to line up where the, the rule of thirds happens. And I'm just going to draw on the back of one of these real quick because I noticed a couple of faces on the Zoom that maybe don't know what I'm talking about with the rule of thirds. Okay, so we've got a rectangle and then we draw two uh, vertical lines and two horizontal lines to divide the image into thirds. And if we have our areas of interest in a composition where those lines intersect, um, then it creates a more interesting composition according to art history in the Western world, if you buy into that, which which I do because it, you know, it's been drilled into me. So, and you got to admit having our eye focused on this delicate little curl on the end of the, the rose there does make it more interesting. So I'm going to try to make that happen in my, I'm going to start from there as I'm sketching, because I want to make sure that that's right there in that, that moment where you could even sketch those lines of thirds onto your your paper um, if that's helpful to you. And then I'm just looking at the shapes of color that I'm seeing. We're going to break this down into colors as we fill this in. We're going to separate our colors and we're going to fill in using the, the watercolor pencils according to colors. We might mix a few colors together. But I'm looking at the main shapes of shadows and light, and I'm looking for the little shapes of different colors. So like there's this uh, greenish gray right here, shadow falling across that petal. I'm going to go ahead and sketch that in. There is a very big shadow across this petal. I'm just letting those shapes of shadows and light and color guide me around. And I want to include a little bit of the background here, which is my old kitchen and um, cabinets and kind of blurry, but we're going to blur it as we're as we're painting it a little bit later. But I think having leaving a little bit of that background in creates some depth here and it kind of puts these roses in a environment of a kitchen right before Valentine's Day here. Although now, oh man, I just realized I scheduled these classes to happen before Valentine's Day on purpose. And then now because of the storm, we're not finishing it until after Valentine's Day. Oh, well, I tried my best. Okay. Um, so I've got most of this white rose, which is hardly a white rose. It's got a lot of yellow and a lot of green. As we get into it, we're gonna see there's a lot of greens and browns and grays um, and yeah, and yellows. So, I mean, it looks yellow, but it also looks like it was a white rose that was maybe picking up the reflection of a lot of the yellow roses around it, or it's just a yellow rose, but it does look very pale. 
All right, another area of interest I really like is this little curly um, green stem that's sticking up right here, this leaf. It's very pointy, and this leaf that's very pointy. And we're getting the three dimensions of those forms. So we're looking at how they curve. So if that's not making any sense to you, you can go check out that drawing funda or flower fundamentals class on drawing roses. Okay, and then the darkest red rose uh, starts or the, the top of it is kind of underneath our little focal point curl here. So we're just lining these up in relationship to each other. And for this one, we're just gonna kind of look for this almost like um, alien spaceship saucer oval shape. So we're gonna try to get this action in there, like a galaxy turned on its side. That's all we're putting. because so we're just capturing the essence here. This rose definitely is getting a lot more detail because it's in the foreground. And this one's also in the foreground, but this one's definitely more in the middle ground along with the yellow one at the top. And then the background is the cabinet. So we wanna make sure we're overlapping correctly here. And normally I say to go from backwards, from the background forward, but I am totally throwing that out the window right now, starting with that focal point, but. All right, and then for the uh, yellow rose back here, I'm just looking for those shapes, those main shadowy shapes, and we're just getting the essence of it in there. I'm drawing nice and lightly. Hopefully you're drawing very lightly so you can easily cover up these lines. Okay, I guess I'll go ahead and put the cabinets in while I'm up here. So we're keeping it real loose and sketchy here. And get my camera to go up there a little more. I'm just getting the main idea of the shapes of light and dark that I'm seeing back there. So I'm keeping it real loose and scribbly. I mean, really just a few lines is enough back there. Like the letter H a few times and we're good. I just wanna get the idea of it. We're gonna keep it really loose when we add the watercolor pencils there. Okay, and then moving to the bottom, apologies for my wobbly camera as I reposition. I guess I could just scoot this whole thing up. I keep forgetting that I'm not taped to the table. Oh my gosh, that would have been a little less jarring. Okay, so this is the other rose that's getting a lot more attention because it's more in the foreground than the other two. And then we do have this orange one that's kind of going off the page over here. This one is probably the one that gave me the most trouble when I was working on it before. I couldn't decide if I wanted to establish all the reds on it or establish the light and darks first. And then I was like, oh, we're gonna make this a mixed media rose. And we're gonna add some pen in here because it was just taking forever to build up the layers with the watercolor pencils. And y'all know I'm working with a time restraint when I'm planning these classes, so I can't do anything that's going to take hours and hours to develop. So that's why I make certain decisions sometimes. Okay, so I know I'm drawing really quickly here, but like I said, you can go back and check out that class that breaks down all the parts of the rows, looking for these main shapes of shadows and main mid-tones here. So we've got about 
three standout values on this rose. We've got that uh, lightest red where the light's hitting it directly. That's more of like a, a pink is how we're going to represent that on um, with the watercolor pencils. And then we've got the red that's got a little bit more of a shadow to it. So more of like a watered down black going over that red. And then we've got our blackest black in those deep recesses of the rose petals. So it's up to you if you want to sketch the shapes of all of those, those values. We're going to end up covering it up with watercolor pencils. You could even just dive right in and not sketch this in pencil first. I did that actually a couple of times when I was uh, sketching these. I think it was with this one. I just went right in with the uh, watercolor pencils. So there's no pencil underneath those. And I just immediately started drawing the curly cues with the, the watercolor pencils. But then I thought, y'all might be mad at me if I did it that way. So I was like, we'll draw it in pencil first. Because it is helpful to have some scaffolding. So lots of little crescent shapes here that are spiraling into each other. Okay, and then we've got our orange rose over here to the side. And we're just bringing that one in because it adds some variety and another little splash of color. Also, there's a little bit of orange poking out at the top here. Right there. So we'll get a little triangular shape for that bit of orange. And there's also another little bit of the orange rose sneaking in right there, like a little tongue shape almost. Okay, and that's, that's it. All right, so that is our pencil sketch scaffolding. Any questions about the sketch? Yeah, it doesn't look like it. We do have a couple of comments. One is I cheated and used graphite paper and traced the line. Okay. And uh, Martha says it's the first time um, she's heard of watercolor pencils. Oh, cool. Yeah, they are a lot of fun. I, I like it because they're easy to transport. You can just, you know, all you really need is your paint brushes and a, a water cup. Although watercolors are pretty easy to transport too, but they're fun. And we can get some different textures to happen with them as well. So, okay, so now we're ready to start adding our watercolor pencils to this. And like I said, if you wanted to, you know, if you're just watching right now and you haven't started drawing your pencil lines and you want to approach it this way, I will say I love how um, loose and watery this yellow background rose feels without the pencil underneath it because it is hard to not um it's hard to not have the um pencil you know if sometimes the pencil doesn't completely erase especially if you press down kind of hard and um I mean you should be able to erase it but it is challenging sometimes to get it to completely go away and just not having it there at all does create a nice effect. So um, I do recommend doing that if you want to just dive right in with it that way. Okay, so we're going to start, uh, even though I sketched kind of from the foreground to the background, I'm going to start from the background and work my way forward with the uh, watercolor pencils so that we can easily fill in any holes in between 
things and we can get our background established so that it's easy to just build on our layers. Always re recommend doing any painting starting from the background forward so that you don't kind of paint yourself into a corner, so to speak. Like if you, you know, painted this red rose, which is darker first, and then realized, you know, you covered up part of the yellow rose, it would be hard to go back and and correct that. Um, but if you, you know, work your way from the background forward, then anything that's overlapping can cover up any issues like that. Uh, I'm going to take my eraser now that I'm done since I drew with such a dark pencil and I'm just going to turn it on its side and erase the top layer of my drawing so that I don't, speaking of, you know, having pencil lines getting in the way, I don't want all my pencil lines in the way. So I know I just erased a lot of the drawing doing that, but that's the thing I teach my kids. If you drew it once, you can draw it again. Um, I think that's a big misconception sometimes that, you know, we don't want to cover up our, our drawing because we're afraid we're going to lose it. But if I, you know, lose any details there, like I kind of did lose a few details, I can easily put them back in. Okay, so we're going to start with the background and work our way forward. So that would be the the cabinets. So I'm going to use a gray gray watercolor pencil and the medium brown, the light brown, the black, and, and this clay yellow. It's a nice color as well. I'm seeing a little bit of that back there. And to build up um, before adding our water. So sometimes there can be an impatience with the watercolor pencils to like hurry up and get the watercolor, uh, the paintbrush water on there to get them to bleed and see what they look like. But I'm going to implore you all to be as patient with yourselves and this process as possible so that you can, you know, build up a nice first layer on every part uh, here before we do that, because once we add water to it, then we got to wait for it to dry before we can add another layer. So I'm putting that clay yellow down, but that's not the only color that I'm going to use up here. And I'm just bouncing around where I see that sort of yellowish brown hue happening. And I'm going to switch to my gray. And this is up to artist interpretation here. If you just want to get like the main idea of some rectangular blurry shapes happening up there and you don't want to. Just realized I'm going to turn down the light on my. My light here a little bit. It was kind of creating more of a glare. I think hopefully we can see that a little better now. Okay, so just adding a little gray. And I'm not really perfectly following the shapes that I see. Getting the main idea of these shapes back here. And I'm gonna use the black. the more I look at it, I'm going to also use this olive green. My old kitchen had this kind of greenish tile. That's what we're seeing there. It doesn't really look that green, but I know it's green. I'm going to put some green. And then I'm going to mix that with the black. So you can mix these colors together just like you would if you were mixing you know, your colors together on your watercolor tray and adding water and mixing them around. We're 
mixing them by layering up the pencils. And then when we add our water with the paint brushes, then these colors will bleed together. And the more watercolor pencil you put down, the more it's going to bleed. So if you're doing a really thin layer of watercolor pencil, then you're going to have a very thin layer of watercolor when you add your water with the paint brushes. If you want it to be really rich and full and you want that color to kind of make a little pool of that color whenever you add the watercolor, then you need to really layer it up and get a lot of color on there. So think about really filling it in. When I used to teach middle school, I would always have students when they were coloring something get really impatient and leave a bunch of gaps in between stuff. And I would say, if that was a house or a bridge, would you feel safe walking across it with all those holes and gaps in between? That was the way that I, I thought about filling in because they would be like, it's filled in. I filled it in. I'm like, oh, I don't know if that was a bridge. I think I might fall through. But I did leave gaps because it's white. So I'm leaving where I want it to be white and leaving it blank paper. So that's why I did that. We do have a white watercolor pencil in this set, but um, I'm going to use that more to blend. It's not necessarily going to create an absolute white. Although it just occurred to me and y'all let me know, or maybe Jimena, could you look at the supply list? I think I might have put white ink on the supply list. And now I can't recall if I did that or did I just put the white jelly roll pen? I should have looked at the supply list. I see a yes from Lily. Okay, good. I think I, yeah, when I did that, I was like, you know what? We're gonna we're gonna pull out all the stops with this mixed media rose painting. So this is the Windsor and Newton uh, white ink that, that is sold at Michaels, and hopefully you all got this because it was on the supply list, even though I forgot until just now to mention it. And uh, you will want some kind of um, dish or uh, a plastic palette would work fine. I work with calligraphy ink, like I told you all um primarily in my work so I have a lot of little ceramic dishes and stuff that I'll use when we get to this point but I just it was driving me nuts when I was working on these examples for some reason I got really into this as y'all can see as I made so many examples but I wanted to make the little white um the white highlights really stand out on those yellow roses. So I thought, well, you could just put some white ink on the supply list and use that at the end. So we're going to do that at the end. And that's, that's what we can also do. So if you have accidentally filled in some of your areas that need to be white, never fear, because we've got white ink on the supply list and white ink. This is a very opaque ink and it will it will cover up a lot of things and we can use that to splash on those uh, star splatter as well, or you can use the, the white jelly roll pen. So yeah, I was like getting really, really extravagant with that supply list. Not really. Okay. Anyway. All right. Let's start building up our yellow roses here. So we need yellow. We need light brown. I'm going to use this clay yellow again. That's a good one. We need medium brown and we need a lot of green. It's kind of hard to tell, but I mean, for me, it's not, but it might be kind of hard to tell how much green is, is on that rose. Like all this is like a very limey green. So we're going to use this yellow green and 
to be emerald green as well. And then we need that for, for the leaves. Okay. So we'll start building up our layers of yellow, but we'll also have this clay yellow in our hands and that light brown on hand and the lime green. So we're really going to be building up with the these four colors here. And let's start with the light brown because there's this really lovely moment happening right here on the edge of, of the rose. And oh, I can zoom in since we're using the digital version here. So it's like this kind of browned rusty moment on the edge of the, the petal. We're going to put that in because so we do actually want our dark brown too. We'll go ahead and put that in. Oh, and we also want gray. There's some gray mixed in here too. And I'm just going to go ahead and start adding the green because that's what I see right there the most. I'm using the side of the pencil, by the way, a lot to fill in. That way it's kind of sitting on the surface of the paper. And whenever I add my water to it, it'll create like a little puddle. And then I can move that puddle around. If you are using the top of the pencil, you're going to be kind of carving it into the paper a little bit more as opposed to letting it sit on the surface not carving it in, but just, you know, embedding it into the, the paper. So I'm using green, and then I'm going over that with a little bit of this gray. And use your, you know, artist interpretation wherever you feel like here. If you don't really like these colors and you want to change the color of these roses, you go right ahead. I am not the boss of you, or if you're having a hard time matching these colors, or you just don't like the way it looks with green and brown on this rose, then do what feels right with your color mixing. But I'm trying to just match it like I see it. And there's a big area here where this green really comes into play. And I'm just watching the time and I'm gonna just try to get as much as I can in terms of color on here before I add any uh, paintbrush action to bleed it together. So. Try to be patient for that. It really, you can always, you know, wait for a layer to dry and keep adding to it. But I think really building up your colors for the first layer is a good, good way to go. And we're definitely gonna, you know, go back in and, and do a lot of this again, because when we, add our first layer of color, some of this is going to get, it's going to bleed together. Some of these details are going to get lost. I'm overlapping the yellow in there with that green. And I am pressing down a little harder here. I'm also following the contours of the curves. That's something I haven't talked about too much so far here, but I talk about it at length in the drawing uh, roses class, the flower fundamentals class is when you make, you know, all of your value shapes follow the curves of the contours. And as we're adding these colors, if I make sure they're kind of hugging, even as I'm applying the watercolor pencil, and then later with my brush strokes, I'll also follow the curve of the contours. And it might be kind of hard to see that I'm doing that, but I am, I assure you. 
kind of rotating around in little circles, but following the overall curve of the rows, that's going to make it feel three-dimensional as opposed to flat. Okay, so there's a lot of details right here. And that flower fundamentals class will be on YouTube. You can just search the words uh, flower fundamentals, artist loft. They should come up pretty easily. Uh, they're also listed on the Michaels website under fine art. There's a whole listing of all of the classes, all the free classes, and those were definitely free. So, Okay, let's move on to a different rose. We can always come back to this one. So on this, this yellow one here, it's a lot of yellow. And then this clay yellow and light brown again. That clay yellow is really our friend for these yellow roses. Kind of a Naples yellow in the watercolor pencils. So I'm kind of trying to capture the whole fullness of this form, that kind of round saucer shape that I called this one. And when we get to that red one underneath it, we're going to do a similar thing really with all of them. We're trying to, because I told y'all I painted this a few different times and I did my underpainting a few different ways. Like in one, I built up the lights and the darks. And then I was like, oh, you know what really needs to happen is we need to just make give it volume first. So the first thing we're going to do is just try to give it some volume. So I'm just filling all that in. You know, paying attention to my contours on this one. I'm paying attention to my contours and my fullness of the form here on the, the background yellow one. And I might just not add anything to the red ones just yet since we're getting close to the end of class. And I want to go ahead and add a little bit of color here. So I'm just going to add some of this clay yellow in some spots. Where I'm seeing that. Get in there with the yellow and make it a little fuller and darker while I'm talking about that. This is where I want a pool of that color to happen when I add the watercolor or the water on our paintbrushes. So we're trying to get some volume to happen. How much time do we have? Exactly nine minutes. Let's do the red rose on the bottom or the middle one real quick. I think we can. So I'm going to take my carmine red and my black. I'm just going to do that again. So I'm filling in the fullness of that form. And I realized just now I didn't do the green stem right there yet. That's okay, because it's overlapping the red rose. So we can go ahead and get a layer of, of water going here. And if you want to do this an alternative way, like with piecing out the values, like I said, I did it a couple of different ways. And I thought this was, even though I had similar results, <laughs> honestly, like at the end, they, you can't even tell probably, but I can tell. I feel like there's, I established volume faster doing it this way. This is what I said, what I meant when I was saying, don't get too attached to your sketch because we're going to cover it up, especially 
right here in this moment. Okay, and it gets super dark right here. I feel like I drew this image so many times, uh, like I've just memorized all the, the tricky moments. Okay, so everywhere where I'm seeing it gets super duper dark black. I'm just going to go ahead and build this up because this black really, when it, you're going to see when we add the the water, it definitely gets moves around very easily. Okay, so now I'm going to grab a couple of different brushes since we've got some light and dark action happening here. Maybe even three brushes. Okay, and I'm going to get a little bit of water on the brush. And I'm just going to start making my little pools of color happen. So you don't want to just take your paintbrush and just cover the whole thing. We want to con have a concentrated blending action happening. So we're trying to blend those greens and grays together. Did it. And then you can clean off your brush. You can like so that it's just watery and you can pull that down and move it around or you can clean it and let it just leave it. Let that area kind of dry on its own, which I highly recommend letting it naturally dry. If you're really impatient and want to use a hair dryer, you can, but I think the way any kind of watercolor naturally bleeds and dries is more interesting than what happens when you push it around with a, because when you use a blow dryer, yeah, it dries faster, but it also pushes the little water puddles around and you kind of lose some of that natural uh, striation that happens in the way that the watercolors dry. So I'm not a huge fan of using a uh, blow dryer unless I really need it. Okay, so now I'm using a different brush. So I don't have to worry about those darker colors bleeding here. And I'm just swirling it around. I'm trying to establish some volume on this yellow rose. I'm trying to make a big puddle of yellow happen. Because this is my first layer. This is my under layer. There's no reason for details just yet. We want to just get, we want some, some volume to happen. We want it to feel nice and round and full. If we focus too much on the details in the early stages, then it doesn't feel like an underpainting. And then it's hard to let go of those details and then establish volume. So I switched my brush again, again, so I don't have to worry about colors bleeding together. And same thing, I'm just gonna take my brush and just bleed that whole rose shape together. And I'm trying not to, but while I'm doing that, trying not to bleed the, the black out of its darker zones too much. Because there are some lighter, well, no, this one's pretty dark. So actually it's fine if we let that, that black bleed around because this one does get really dark. All right, so not a lot of detail yet. We're just establishing volume. Although on this, this one, since it is so light, we're not going to put probably quite as many layers on it as the other ones. Where that lime green really bleeds, I maybe went a little hard on the white, on the lime green. No, that's pretty good actually. It does get that limey. Okay, and I'm leaving some gaps where the white is, but we also have that white ink to help us if we need it. But if you don't have the white ink, then try to leave 
gaps where you're seeing those absolute white highlights. Okay, here's a tricky thing that's happening. My red is bleeding onto my green rose right there. So would have been a good idea to wait for that to dry or go in a different order from light to dark here. But that's not what I did. I was getting impatient. Okay, I'm gonna switch like a cooking show back to, to this one. Okay, so when it dries, cause it's all wet right now, but when it dries, we should have something that looks sort of like this. Although I did already kind of start going back into it and putting the, the second and third layers on, but you get the idea. Okay, we have one minute left. I'd love to see some of y'all's uh, paintings and sketches, your mixed media pieces up until now, even if they're just in the very early phases and if they're taped down, then I understand you can't hold them up. But if anybody has anything to share, it's always nice to see and we can just hold them up and we'll spotlight you. Okay, so we have a few. Let me go with a model first. Oh, yes, very nice. All right, looks like you're still building up with the watercolor pencils. And then we have Goins family. Um, okay, very nice and concentrated there. That looks like maybe a different flower image. That's nice. Then we have Janet. Oh, nice. Yeah, I like how you're starting to bleed those colors. Oh, and that red rose really has some good volume so far. And we have Ethan Trout. Very nice. And we have Amy. Ooh, I like how you're getting those bold outlines going. Very stylish. And then, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was just saying it's very stylized. And then we have, I think, oh, Allison. Oh, yes. Really nice volume there. It looks like you just went in with the watercolors too. No pencil. Love it. And then Barbara. All the deckled edges on that paper too. Oh, yes. Very nice and delicate. Love it. And then I see James holding it up, but then it's gone. Oh, there we go. There's James. Oh, yes, very nice. I can tell that green and yellow is blending together nicely. All right, these are off to such a great start. I'm excited about part two, but we just have to wait. So next week will be uh, the premium class on figure drawing using a grid, which you don't want to miss. So make sure you sign up for uh, that one. It's a two-part class. And if you struggle with capturing proportions with a figure, using a grid will be a game changer for you. Um, we'll be using a photograph of our model, Jimena, which I had a photo shoot, who I had a photo shoot with last year. And we've been using images of her for a lot of those figure drawing classes. And then, so the night after that grid drawing class ends, not on a regularly scheduled night, but it'll be Thursday, February 23rd, will be part two of this class. So stay tuned for that. And hopefully I'll see you all in those premium classes. Uh, until then, thank you and have a great evening. Good night.